Hey guys, before we get going, if you use trading apps, you got to check out eToro. It's a good way to gain exposure to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies while still getting your fix with the more traditional assets that you might know more about or just want more exposure to. eToro is also a social trading platform, which means it's kind of like social media and trading together. With copy trading, you can copy or just sort of adapt to the trading strategies of some of the best traders worldwide on the platform. This is not only going to give you exposure to how people are buying Bitcoin, but it's also going to show you what people are doing when they're expecting downturns or, you know, one of those bull runs. So head over to eToro.com to get started on your 2020 portfolio today. eToro, smart crypto trading made easy. Welcome, welcome. What's up, everybody? Dave Hollerith here. This is the Bitcoin Magazine podcast, and today I'm taking you into two conversations with business leaders from the Bitcoin community. First, an interview with Obi Inuasu. He's CEO of the UK's largest Bitcoin exchange, CoinFloor. Then, an interview with Munib Ali, the CEO of Blockstack. So even though CoinFloor and Blockstack are two very different cryptocurrency businesses, I wanted to pair these interviews together because both companies have recently made intriguing business moves by further supporting Bitcoin and its security. CoinFloor is well known for using proof of reserves since 2013 when they started. This is a way to prove their solvency month over month. It's something that's really important and I think they're the only exchange which does it, which is kind of a bad sign. Now they want to offer a simplified and effective Bitcoin buying service to help onboard new users and make an effort at least to decrease Bitcoin's overall volatility. While Blockstack has put out a new white paper showing their case for doubling down on Bitcoin by giving network participants sats back for helping operate their own blockchain. So I wanted to highlight these conversations together to give you an idea of how businesses either embedded in the Bitcoin community or otherwise are approaching growth in 2020 with a mindset that Bitcoin has to come first. Here's the first one with Obi Inuasu, CEO of CoinFloor. Nice to meet you, Dave. Nice to meet you too, Obi. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Yesterday, I just I, I talked to uh, Muni Bali, the CEO of Blockstack. They they were sort of using the Bitcoin blockchain beforehand, but um, they're making a pivot of of giving Bitcoin back to um, node operators, basically. And uh, yeah, I've been listening to this. They they've gone from proof of burn to proof of transfer. Yeah, the POX stuff. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, I, I think it's reasonable for plenty of people to be skeptical about, uh, you know, whether or not why they have a token, you know, what the purpose of the token is in this scenario. But it is interesting because it's definitely, to me, it seems like it's part of a larger trend. And you guys have been very clear about that um, delisting ETH and focusing just on Bitcoin. And uh, I also know you, I mean, like Blockstack, you guys have been in the game since 2013, 2014-ish. Um, yeah. And, and um, you know, I know you've always had kind of a strong focus in Bitcoin. So before I like say, why'd you guys make this pivot? I'd like to uh, have you just sort of explain your thinking in this because it doesn't really sound like a pivot to me. It sounds like something you've kind of been thrusting towards since you guys started. I'm really glad you said that and your intuition is correct. Um, when we started, there was only Bitcoin really. It's the only option in town. Uh, when you talked about cryptocurrencies or the block space chain now called blockchain, you were only talking about Bitcoin. Um, and even prior to that in 2011, when I first heard about Bitcoin, that's what really got me excited about the space. We were Bitcoin only for a long time. And then that fateful day, there was a, a coin scrum event where Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen discussed um, a benevolent dictator for, for Bitcoin, which was the sort of the point where most people look at when we started having a conversation that ended up with the fork between Bitcoin Cash and, and Bitcoin. And at that point, that was the first point we went from a single cryptocurrency exchange to a multiple cryptocurrency exchange because all of our users instantaneously had Bitcoin. And we actually made this post on Reddit at the time where we said, look, we'll support both coins after a lot of discussion, but 
lots of people were deciding which one was actually the cash. We made the decision, I think one of the first to come out of the exchanges to make the decision and go public saying that whichever is the most support from the community, the people, is the one that we're going to follow. Not, it doesn't matter what the support from miners is, it's going to be the support from the people. And that's the one we're going to call Bitcoin and the other one we'll call whatever it is. The fork happened, supported by Bitcoin Core, was the, became the dominant chain from a people support point of view. We listed Bitcoin Cash and we again went from a single currency exchange to a multi-currency exchange. Fast forward, Ethereum was getting more and more popular. People were talking about it, but we were starting to define a number of criteria which we would use to objectively decide what we listed or not. We didn't see how Ethereum fits that criteria. It was a great project, um, an experiment, which is fine, people can experiment, but as a currency that I would, with a straight face, offer to my customers to, to try and invest in or buy or sell, it didn't seem to fit that criteria. At the end of 2018, it finally got to a point where, one, the Ethereum community started stating that they believed that Ethereum was a money up until then, they thought it wasn't money, in which case, why would I be listing it if you don't think it's money? Um, and two, it was getting a lot of traction. So we finally started to list it. So literally, just over a year ago is when we finally listed Ethereum, one of the last of the exchanges to do so. Halfway through last year, six months after that, Vitalik Buterin and many other um, people in the Ethereum space came out publicly saying that Ethereum 1 wasn't good enough to scale. It never was, in fact, good enough to scale. And we're going to have to make a completely new blockchain and cryptocurrency Ethereum 2. We right. may rename Ethereum in the future, and we will allow you to transfer through airdrops or some mechanism your value from one to the other. But it, it wasn't even a soft fork or a hard fork. It's a completely new blockchain. So in our view was, if the core developers of a blockchain and cryptocurrency state that it's not good enough to scale, then I can't have a reasonable position where I believe it's good when the actual people who are supporting and develop it don't believe it's good enough to last for the future. So at that point, our decision was really clear. We have to delist Ethereum. And for similar reasons, um, over the, the last year of observing what happened with Bitcoin Cash, we delisted that as well. Yeah, yeah. You also made a statement in an interview I read yesterday, actually. You said sort of that tech and crypto companies have become too self-focused to the detriment of their customers. And that is something you guys, CoinFloor, want to rectify. Can you sort of elaborate on that? It happened before with mining, which was what led to the, the wars, as it were, the, the blockchain wars and the Bitcoin versus Bitcoin cash wars. Yeah. Fundamentally, there was this view that the miners had the power and the people sort of followed the miners. And then there was another view that the people had the power and we decided to allow certain miners to receive a reward in return for a service they're providing to us. Eventually, that battle was decided with the forking of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, and we can maybe determine which one was the right way based on the market cap of the two different currencies. I think in the background, a similar debate um, and misunderstanding has been going on, and it's getting more and more um, clear, which is that people right now are in deference to exchanges. So they now believe that there's these really high-powered exchanges with huge volumes, huge revenues, and it's a similar repeat of the same misunderstanding. The exchanges are service providers, and then there are service patrons, people who patronize the service. The mistake people are making is that they believe that the exchanges have power, just like the miners, the power is illusory. You have power because you're allowed to have power by your users. The user decides to vote instead of with their nodes, they vote with their dollars or pounds, in our case, being in London. If they decide to vote with their pounds, they can switch um, exchange in a matter of hours. So if the exchange is doing something that you don't want to do, you don't need to just sort of hope that they change. You can vote and move across. That starts happening. They will change the tune in a matter of, of weeks. We saw it come to a head at one point. There was a, a scenario which was a little bit an example of almost hubris a few months ago 
where there was a theft and an exchange operator actually suggested that they would do a, a, uh, a reversal of, of the actual Bitcoin blockchain. I won't say the name of the exchange, but this is an example of a misunderstanding of who has the power. At that point, there was a big pushback from the community. And within an instant, this potentially very powerful exchange changed their tune. And that's because they very quickly realized their power is illusory. Um, now, the problem that we have is that for too many years now, because we've been focused on high net worths, institutional and professional traders, not the retail space. The retail um, market haven't had a choice. All the exchanges offer multiple cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, all coins, maybe you can define them, and some of them you can clearly define as maybe even shit coins. They offer all of these, and their their incentives aren't aligned with their customers. They want customers to trade as much as possible. For most customers, it's not a good idea to trade as much as possible. So there's a fundamental misalignment. So they're asking the customers to do things that are not in their customers' interests. Now. The customers need a choice of an exchange, which is offering them a service which is actually aligned with their interests. And mm -hmm. for the more normal guy in the street, you should not be trying to trade. Even the best traders in the world, most of them are bad at trading. So what hope is an, a normal guy just wants to gain more Bitcoin and improve their lot? And so what we are coming out with is a cryptocurrency exchange, a Bitcoin exchange, not for the 1% who are professionals or who like to speculate, but for the 99% who just want their Bitcoin buying to be boring. That's what, that's what most people want. They don't want it to be fast. They don't want it to be easy. They don't want it to be lots of options. They just want it to be boring. Money should be boring for most people. And there isn't an option for that where it just works. You just buy, you invest safely, in which case the only option should be stuff like dollar cost averaging. You should have proof of custody because... Why do large organizations don't want to tell you whether they're solvent or not? Mm -hmm. And you also should have clear, no nonsense, no BS, no no coin BS um, education, as we said. Yeah, the the, the proof of uh, solvency that you guys do, I think you're the only exchange to do that. Unfortunately, yeah. And we've asked every month, whenever we release this, we have a repeating line, which is, we hope that other exchanges do this. Because proof of solvency allows you to know whether an exchange has been hacked or it's misappropriating your funds. There should be no reason why an exchange doesn't want to do this. It cannot be a capability thing. I mean, we think we've got, we've got an amazing group of people here, but I don't think that this is beyond the wit of man for any other exchange in the world to be able to do this. Some with resources far in excess of ours. So we don't understand the excuse, the reason why no other exchange does this. And after six years of doing it, and from next month, it'll be six years straight, we're going to have to start being more um, vocal about asking the question, why the hell are you not proving that you're solvent. And it's as simple as that. I mean, there's so much in the Bitcoin business ecosystem, I think, of people wanting to change the world, which is sort of, you know, that's that's a, a big narrative in tech. But in Bitcoin, especially, it's to change the world from how banking has been is being done right Bitcoin. now and other things like that. And being able to prove solvency seems like a fundamental part of actually fulfilling that promise of change just because it's possible to be done. We have done it. We have proven it's possible consistently month in, month out. Next week, we'll be doing our um, 71st first proof of solvency audit. And then in March, it'll be our 72nd. Now, some people apparently are doing higher trade volumes than us and are apparently are have higher amounts of Bitcoin than we custody. My question is, is it more or less important to prove you're solvent the, more ba the higher the balance you have? And if we can do it, everybody else should be able to do it. And if, you, if, the, if you're not doing it, then again, as a customer who should be voting with their pockets, you should be asking the question, why aren't you taking any attempts to prove that you are solvent, to prove that, that you have the money that you say you have, and to prove that you aren't taking that money and trading it on other people's exchanges, for example, which is something that banks in the traditional space do, but it's risky to be done, and that, which is why there are many controls and checks which aren't in the, in the crypto space. Well, can you get into more detail about the kind of services you're, you're talking about? Yeah, so we've been on the sidelines when it comes to retail, and we've been focused on professional traders, institutions, sophisticated investors, and traders. What we are announcing is an extension of our services to also provide a service for retail. So we want to bring Bitcoin to all. We think retail requires three things. One, it requires a really easy way to 
buy Bitcoin. The first decision was to decide to deal with Bitcoin only because going more than going from one to two complicates the offering. And the reality is that the vast majority of interest volumes support is Bitcoin. So why try to confuse things with more than one when you're getting 85 to 95 percent of everything by just dealing with Bitcoin? Um, and we announced that in December and the reaction was incredible. I could just ask, go into the details later on, but it was incredible. Support behind the scenes, but that was amazing. And the offering will allow you to buy Bitcoin in a very easy way, which is aligned with the interests of the retail public. Retail want buying Bitcoin to be boring. And one of their big concerns is volatility. Mm -hmm. If you like speculating your trader, you love volatility. But the average guy or girl in the street gets concerned about volatility. How do you deal with that? Simple. We call it something complicated, which is called dollar cost averaging, which is taking a certain amount of pounds or dollars, buying regularly the same time, the same amount, no matter where the price goes up, or whether the price goes down. Because if you do that, what happens is if you're buying regularly as the price moves up or down, you're averaging out the price and you're effectively removing the, the short-term volatility. So all you now need to think about is the long-term movement of the price. Now, from a long-term perspective, Bitcoin has outperformed almost every other asset on the planet in the long term. So long term, Bitcoin is volatile in a positive direction. Short term, it's scary. And you, you remove that by dollar cost averaging. Okay. So the only option that we're going to give people is dollar cost averaging or potentially the odd additional purchase. But the trading parts of the business, you would have to that's still available for advanced users. So you'd have to ask additional questions. So we, and we'll feed back to you whoever we think is appropriate for you to trade. You could decide to do that and ignore our advice, but we want to push you towards the thing that's actually going to be the most likely thing to improve your lot over time. So yeah. that's the buying service. The second one is custody. The reality is, is that when you come into Bitcoin, you're a novice. You may be a award-winning maxiofacial um, plastic surgeon or a captain of industry, but you start a new skill. You have to start from the beginning again. And as a and as someone at the beginning, we are, it's likely it's unreasonable to expect you to be your own bank right at the beginning. I'm fully on board with people being their own bank, but to begin with, get them to understand the fundamentals of of Bitcoin, buy regularly, and slowly educate them as to the way of of how you can be your own bank, and then and then they finally can move over to custody himself. But in the interim, we need to have a safe place to custody. The way we do that is obviously we do multi-sig. We, we have a lot of things that everybody else does in terms of securing the Bitcoin. But the fundamental thing is to prove and verify that we're doing that. And that's where proof of custody comes in. If you don't have proof of custody, if we're not allowing you to personally have the potential to verify that we're solvent, then you're having to trust us. And we're trying to minimize that trust. We can never eliminate it because we are custodying it. But we're minimizing that. And then the final element is an education center, but we call it a no BS education center. It tends to focus a lot on Bitcoin, but only because when you actually go through the reality, it's very clear that Bitcoin is way ahead of everybody else. And, and this is a reaction to certain offerings out there where you're being paid money to learn about basically shit coins. So people are subsidized shit coin shilling, as I call it. And these offerings aren't aligned for the customer because you, you'll see these sites where they'll show Bitcoin and then next to it, they'll show a currency with one hundredth of the volume and one ten thousandth of the adoption and support. But for someone who's coming in new, if you look at them, it makes it look like they're similar in terms of support and, and strength when, it, when nothing could be further from the truth. Right. So we will provide an antidote to that with a very clear, no nonsense, no BS education space. We're not subsidized. We're not paid by Bitcoin to teach people this. We are just going to tell you what's in your best interest in simple, hopefully as close to as possible, explain it like I'm five type language. Yeah. Are these going to be um, like written articles or videos or? So we're going to begin with written articles. And then over time, every month, we will add to the body of information. So it might be videos, it might be podcasts and so on. We also point to other resources where it makes sense. So to begin with, we'll point up resources that we think also explain key subsets of the concepts in, in a, an acceptable way. We don't feel that we're going to need to be the only place to be educated around cryptocurrencies. And again, we actually tell people 
to you should go off and seek other sources to claim that you're the sort the, the true source of information again in our my mind and, and our mouths is, is is bs but we have to make a start somewhere and that's our start there are some other exciting projects i'm seeing in the bitcoin education space and i'm really we're talking with the people who are working on those and we'll be happy to promote those when they come out as well yeah you, i guess you can't say anything right now no because they're new but but and that's for them to announce but but okay. there are a lot of people understanding that we have to counter a lot of the confu- a lot of the confusion for people uh, who are new to the space are people who have misaligned incentives educating them on yeah trading is easy no it's not for most people or yeah you should trade against multiple cryptocurrencies when we know that generally that's a path to losing money for people yeah um, this is kind of random, but um, okay. are, are you guys uh, thinking about uh, what, what are your thoughts on um, more advanced types of services for people to um, use their Bitcoin? Um, like one that I've sort of just started to pay attention to is like a crypto or Bitcoin IRA, which in your case, um, it's the uh, I, I, it's a self invested uh, pension plan in the UK, I think. Like, ha- ha- have you guys, uh, what are your thoughts on those? I, it's, it's kind of early to be rolling something like that out, but I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, so again, as I say, we have to sort of walk before we run. So the yeah. first, so that's my general view. Focus on getting people into Bitcoin, understanding the basics in a secured um, way with a simple aligned service. So that's our focus. So we we built the world's first physically delivered futures offering. Mm -hmm. Um, And ultimately, we spun it off at the beginning of last year. Around the time we um, also um, delisted, um, also were originally listing um, Ethereum. Um, And it eventually became CoinFlex, which is a, a cryptocurrency exchange does about 200 plus million volumes. So that was spun off. We still have an equity stake in that and that does very well. And it beats backed by several months to being the first physically delivered futures exchange in its prior guise as CoinFlorex. So we're not a stranger to more sophisticated offerings. We've also looked at centralized um, um, finance, so lending and interest offerings, but we want to analyze these things more because we do see we do see a number of risks in the the crypto lending space. For sure, there's a lot of behind the scenes. There's lots of risks around potential rehypothecation. The things that caused problems in the that led to the birth of Bitcoin. We see things of that happening in the lending space. So we we want to keep an eye on that before deciding. Uh, we want to be comfortable with the risks because we we take protecting our customers. <laughs> and their money is very seriously. And it's not just about making short-term cash. We have a very low time preference and think about the long-term for ourselves and our customers. But an IRA or some sort of simple savings vehicle, probably calling it a less tech technical term, we'll give it a very simplified name so that people understand it, is something that we would be interested in, in considering down the line. Uh, but we want to get the basics working solid, solidly um, would probably want to roll that out across Europe and maybe even to to North America and then look at adding more more services. But we really don't want to complicate the offering though and get it because we want to make sure that when people come in new, they're not sort of bombarding with 15 different options and then they get, they get frightened and they walk away. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So my last question, uh, you guys uh, actually launched in 2013 sort of like right into a bear market. Yeah, yeah. And, and as, as such, uh, you guys are, I consider you a company that has uh, weathered many storms. And right now it seems like it's probably dumb even mentioning it, but it seems like uh, Bitcoin is hitting a bull market stride right now. So I'm just curious um, what your take is on managing a Bitcoin business in the cycle of the ups and downs? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I've been involved with various dot-com startups. Pretty much my whole career was startups. Yeah. Um, so you're like addicted to this stuff. Uh, I'm, addi- I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to yeah. it. Well, thanks, Obi. Thanks for coming on the show. It's uh, great to talk to you. And 
And now, here's my interview with Blockstack's Munib Ali on how they're looking to further leverage Bitcoin while scaling their own blockchain. The, the 1.0 design is more like a, a virtual blockchain, right? So all the data is actually written into the Bitcoin blockchain and there are no kind of like native miners there. So Bitcoin miners are processing uh, uh, Stacks 1.0 transactions as well. Right? So that's the current system. And Stacks 2.0 is our master design, you know, the blockchain that we, that we wish existed when uh, we were starting off. And over there, it's a separate blockchain and you could kind of like um, secure it through proof of work um, or, or some other mechanism but we ended up going for this very interesting interplay uh, between Bitcoin and the Stacks 2.0 chain. And the idea really is that, you know, we've been benefiting from the security of Bitcoin uh, on the Stacks 1.0 chain, and we wanted to, to kind of like maintain those security benefits while introducing new features, right? So uh, the concept becomes that how can you anchor uh, the security of your blockchain back into Bitcoin but you are free enough from Bitcoin that you can have uh, fuller smart contract languages, you can have faster confirmation times and, and basically have more flexibility. Yes, I, th I think uh, conceptually it's similar. So with Bitcoin, the experimentations that we have seen is one is around merged mining where people are saying that, hey, just make the hashing algorithm the same and let Bitcoin miners uh, mine on, on your chain as well. Right. So this goes back in history to even like the first fork of Bitcoin uh, that was Namecoin. And, and, the, and the, the fundamental issue that we see with merge mining is that you have to convince a lot of Bitcoin miners uh, to merge mine. Right. Like if only, let's say, 30, 40 percent of Bitcoin miners are, are merge mining, then they actually have uh, a lot of mining power on the on the merged mine chain. Right. Similarly, then there are side chains where uh, you're trying to figure out these two way pegs. Uh, you can you can transfer Bitcoin and then transfer them back. We think that our design is uh, in some ways gives you more flexibility. You're defining new types of crypto assets, right? And uh, there's a very interesting interplay where because miners are participating in leader election by sending Bitcoin transactions on the Bitcoin chain, for someone to attack the history of the blockchain, they would have to attack Bitcoin. And I think that's the property that we wanted to maintain where uh, kind of like the security of the Stacks 2.0 chain is anchored back into Bitcoin because miners are sending Bitcoin transactions uh, for uh, trying to compete in the leader election mechanism. Um, and acknowledging that Blockstack's been around since 2013, and also what you pointed out, um, how originally uh, it was uh, connected to uh, the actual Bitcoin blockchain. I think securing Blockstack this way with Bitcoin Sounds like a new use case for Bitcoin. It can also be received by some uh, members of the crypto community as more of a PR move for Blockstack. And I acknowledge there's some irony here because I'm saying this as a staff member for Bitcoin magazine. So bias uh, up front. But uh, many companies have pivoted towards Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin, not blockchain. That's like a popular meme that's come out. And I think there's a lot of discuss right now, whether justified or not, around more at the more abstract concept of a blockchain. Why did Blockstack decide to make this move? Yeah, so I think, I think those are fair points. So I'm going to break them up a little bit and, and get into it. I think the first thing is just the community aspect of it, right? Where uh, I think Bitcoiners uh, feel that, you know, uh, they, they are uh, protectors of this something very pure, uh, that shouldn't change and you know other people are trying to either compete with it or trying to benefit from it when they're really not uh, contributing something to the ecosystem right so there is there's a crypto industry has that kind of a uh, uh, outlook where you know they're they're very skeptical that why is someone doing as, as something and you know they're uh, so that that kind of attitude and i think in general you you if you go back you know as you said blockstack has been around on for years and we have noticed how uh, there's a lot of innovation happening uh, in other ecosystems. Like if you take DeFi as an example, there are so many startups now around the Ethereum ecosystem. And we, we decided not to build in, in the Ethereum ecosystem because of some fundamental design differences in how we believe uh, blockchains uh, should function. But there is a lot of innovation happening in that ecosystem, right? And we would love to see more 
uh, developers innovating in the Bitcoin ecosystem because we, we, are, we, are, we believe in a world. So, so let, let, let's keep in mind that Stacks 1.0 operated completely on top of Bitcoin. And the reason was that we wanted to benefit from Bitcoin's security. So Stacks 2.0 is also benefiting from Bitcoin security, but it's able to introduce features that you cannot introduce at the, at the Bitcoin layer. Let me, let me dig a little bit deeper into it and, and um, uh, that, would, that would make more sense. Yeah, the so features, think, the features. Go yeah, on. exactly. So first of all, the Bitcoin blockchain has a very limited scripting language and for good reason, right? You don't want to run a full Turing complete or even a fully expressive, even non-Turing complete language at the Bitcoin layer. Uh, Bitcoin derives its security from that limited scripting language. Similarly, Bitcoin is durable meaning that people can trust it, that it's not going to change, right? And which, which is, again, a good thing, right? You want something stable, something durable uh, that other, other things can anchor on. But at the same time, these properties also become limiting if you're now thinking about uh, adding new features. Like what if, you know, why can't DeFi uh, type applications work in the Bitcoin ecosystem? Or... Uh, why can't Web3 emerge on top of Bitcoin or, or benefit from the security of Bitcoin? So then we get into how do we introduce these features? Like, for example, we have a new uh, uh, smart contract programming language called Clarity. Uh, so it's not Turing complete. It basically focuses on predictability and security of smart contracts. So there is very precise. People know exactly what the programs can and cannot do even before uh, executing them. But we cannot introduce that uh, smart contract language at the Bitcoin layer. We can introduce that in a new blockchain like Stacks 2.0, but then instead of doing proof of work, which is like trying to create your own small island, right? You're saying that just like on Bitcoin, miners are burning electricity and going from electricity uh, to a proof of work token. We are creating our own small island where miners also burn electricity and they go from electricity to a proof of work token. And the idea with POX is, that don't repeat that process. You already went from electricity to a proof of work token. Now use that proof of work token uh, to participate in consensus of, of a separate chain. So, so what happens is that if you're a miner, you actually have visibility into both the Bitcoin chain and the Stacks 2.0 chain, right? A, a Every, Bitcoin miner or, or a- A Stacks, a Stacks, a Stacks miner. miner. Right. Big, big, Bitcoin miners don't need to know anything. Like for them, all of this looks like normal Bitcoin transactions. Bitcoin doesn't, doesn't need to change at all, which is the property we want to maintain. So for, if you're a Stacks miner, you need to have visibility into both the Bitcoin state and the Stacks 2.0 state. And that's what our software does, right? If you run a Stacks uh, blockchain node and you're a miner, you do that. And they are basically, their incentive to participate is that they want to write new Stacks blockchain blocks they want to collect the newly minted Stacks tokens from it. They want to collect all the transaction fees uh, and people are registering digital assets, which is a new feature, right? Uh, it doesn't exist in Bitcoin. They collect the, uh, the uh, Stacks used for registering those digital assets. And more importantly, the Clarity smart contract execution fees, right? So this is the incentive for the Stacks miners uh, for participating in consensus. But the way they participate in consensus like every miner has a cost model, right? Like sometimes your cost is expressed in, um, you know, cost of ASICs plus electricity, or if, you, if it's proof of stake, it's kind of like you are holding on to a certain cryptocurrency and you're actively participating by, by putting it up for stake. Uh, in this case, the cost is expressed as Bitcoins, right? So that's the threshold. My, miners are spending Bitcoin and they're earning stacks through these, uh, block rewards and transaction fees and clarity smart contracts, right? And, and on the Stacks blockchain, so these are miners. Other than miners, everybody else, developers, users, normal people, they don't, they don't need to interact with, with uh, the Bitcoin side of it. They only view Stacks 2.0 as a separate blockchain. Uh, they can run smart contracts on it. They can register their usernames. They can publish applications, like all of the functionality that, that Blockstack basically has. But interestingly, they can also participate in consensus where you can, uh, we call them stackers, right? So you are running a full node and you have a certain amount of uh, the stacks cryptocurrency that you are holding for a certain time, let's call it a month. And you are signaling certain important information on the network. 
basically which what's the current fork of the blockchain and that information is useful uh, for the stacks miners and now you're earning bitcoin on your stacks holding which is a very interesting interplay between two crypto assets i think what we're trying to create here is synergy between crypto assets where by holding one you can actually earn the other which is something that doesn't exist in the industry right now like you have staking where you are earning more of the same asset and you're also putting up your funds that can be slashed over here there's no slashing because your your, your funds are not at risk uh, you're participating you're adding value and you're earning bitcoin on the on the stack side uh, i'm i'm definitely in agreement that uh DeFi, i i think sounds like uh not bitcoin in a lot of ways to a lot of people and and i don't think that should be correct and i don't think that's was anyone's really intention um so uh this move is is pretty interesting from that perspective um but i'm curious uh what is the point of the uh stacks token in this scenario yep so i think stacks token is what gets consumed if uh you know we, we have more than 400 applications built on top of Blockstack. And one of the first things users do is they register a username, right? So the same username works on every single app. Think of that as a universal username that you have. So to register that username at the blockchain layer, you're actually using the Stacks tokens to register it. Similarly for Clarity smart contracts. So think of, think of actually a very easy example is just think of Ethereum, right? It has a concept of gas. Uh, you execute you know, smart contracts, you register digital assets, uh, and it's used for mining rewards and uh, all of that functionality. So I think Stacks token is similar to kind of uh, how ETH gets used, but it is anchored in Bitcoin. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so uh, that also makes me wonder, I, it sounds like maybe you're saying that uh, this, is, this is happening um, by how the miners have to run sort of about the Bitcoin blockchain um, on top or the Stacks blockchain on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but I'm curious, um, in the future, uh, are you, uh, does Blockstack plan to work with or contribute at all to Bitcoin development in other ways? I mean, absolutely, as, as helpful um, as we can be. I think Bitcoin actually does a good job uh, maintaining the core blockchain. Like they're, I think it's one of the most actively uh, developed, actively audited. There's lots of eyeballs on on, on Bitcoin, and that's why we feel uh, good about the security of Bitcoin. I, I think where um, things can improve is actually innovation from developers around the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I think a great example of that is actually Lightning. Right? Yeah. Lightning is trying to innovate on top of Bitcoin. Uh, it is building solutions, and I think the Bitcoin community likes it a lot partially because of the fact that Lightning doesn't have a new token in it, right? But they like the fact that, you know, it's, there's no token involved because the token comes with a lot of emotional baggage, right? For a lot of people that, hey, why, why is there a token? And, you know, the default answer is like, there shouldn't be a token. Uh, but otherwise, Lightning is great. Now think of POX as something where we're innovating in the same ecosystem. We're trying to make uh, Bitcoin uh, more valuable like if things like imagine if web three like why couldn't web three emerge on top of bitcoin is a question that i think bitcoiners should ask themselves right like if if, if anything web three should emerge on top of bitcoin because bitcoin is the most secure chain like it will be good for web three and it will be good good for uh, for bitcoin but our design inherently has two crypto assets and there's an interplay between them and i think this is where uh, you know, people become a little bit more skeptical and, and, and the questions come in that, hey, why do you need a token? Well, the token is needed because it is fuel for a smart contract language that doesn't exist on Bitcoin, right? So you need, need to go through the explanations and then, you know, it clicks in people's minds that, okay, this, this actually makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm curious uh, about uh, your future goals uh, for the kind of apps that Blockstack would develop. Um, uh, also, to just to put it into context, um, maybe you should answer this question first. Um, last month, uh, you guys unlocked six point eight million dollars uh, that was raised funds from investors, and it was because you hit a milestone of having one million users on your platform. Now, critics have poked holes in this, and they've said that they, they've said that the rate that your network grew. 
um, in the agreement policy for which necessitated you uh, unlocking the funds um, was sort of impos impossible to measure or was incorrectly measured um, regarding user growth. Um, and this has a lot to do with your privacy focus. Um, and I believe you addressed this in a town hall meeting on Monday, but for our listeners, can you sort of address this again? And then I, I'll ask you the question again about uh, sort of goals. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So uh, this actually goes back to uh, Blockstack's approach of uh, being very transparent, being very disciplined. Uh, this is 2017 when, you know, there was a Wild West era uh, in uh, token offerings. And Blockstack actually went for a very sophisticated uh, structure for, uh, for our token offering where we were uh, setting up Delaware funds, right? And people were becoming limited partners in the funds. And we had self-imposed milestones, right? So there was no reason for us to have these milestones completely self-imposed to show discipline that, you know, in the first year, we're going to work on the core infrastructure and we are going to... Uh, uh, launch the Stacks 1.0 blockchain, right? And there was a certain amount of uh, funding that unlocks with it. And the second milestone was uh, uh, basically initial network growth that we just don't want to build technology in a vacuum. We want to tell people about it. We want them to experience it in, one, in, in uh, some format. And we were very explicitly clear about the privacy issues, uh, uh, not even issues, their features, right? Like we don't want to have trackers in any applications. We, 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 we're, it was uh, completely against our uh, values. So we, there was a very precise legal definition of what that initial uh, growth means. It basically means that from any source, if there are digital assets like usernames or domain names getting registered, and, and, and through some mechanism, we can separate out uh, bots from real users, right? And it was, uh, it was basically under our discretion, uh, discretion of Blockstack PBC, that exactly how you would try to like separate out bots from users, right? So when, so we launched the, the Stacks 1.0 uh, blockchain very successfully, uh, unlocked the first milestone. And then for the second milestone, what we did was we actually did a lot of partnerships uh, we, we started seeing a lot of uh, developer traction as well. Like we got more than 400 uh, applications. So we were getting users from different sources with the intention that they're just getting introduced to Blockstack. We have never, ever claimed that these are active users. This is, this is more like, I think, uh, similar to a sign up on a website, right? That you just tried out an app, you signed up into it, or you went through block, uh, we had a partnership with blockchain.com where people are getting stacks tokens. We were running our own um, kind of like uh, versions of giving people incentives and crypto to come out and test applications, right? So this is, this is basically, basically education and exposure, right? And, and, so, and people are, are coming through different sources, right? Again, to, uh, to reemphasize that this is self-imposed and this is in front of a very sophisticated advisory board that happens to be our investors or professors. And uh, we went through the process and we met that self-imposed milestone. Whereas I would say that in crypto, uh, there's a lot of kind of like skepticism and uh, almost like, you know, any opportunity of attacking somebody. Like for, for example, uh, this is a milestone. Uh, we have been extremely transparent about uh, our, our entire operations because we did the first ever SEC qualified offering. I think, I think usually people would be very appreciative of the fact that a project is being ex extremely transparent. Even our financial statements and everything is publicly disclosed. We get attacked for that, right? Like people would pick up some weird detail and twist it and, 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 and be like, oh, what is that in your financial statement? Well, the fact that every single thing is public and there's a full disclosure uh, is, 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 is something that I, I'm extremely proud of. Uh, but then, you know, the more information there is, the more people tend to kind of like pick it apart and, uh, and twist things around as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of that, uh, has to do with, uh, sort of trauma from 2017, but I, I mean, and that being that a lot of people are, are weary of tokens, tokens that, uh, might be for speculation. Um, and the fact that you guys did, uh, 
go through that process with the SEC is uh, very unique. I mean, you, it sounds like you, you were saying uh, you guys were the first. I, I'm pretty sure I read that too. With all that uh, out of the way, um, I, I read your Medium post. Uh, I don't know how old it is, but uh, it was about can't be evil um, as opposed to like do no evil. Um, yeah, I felt like you did a really good job of explaining um, sort of the difference between um, trust by design or, or verification by design as opposed to um, sort of like getting approval from a third party. And, and I do think that that is sort of at the heart of uh, sort of what's going on in cryptocurrency. With all that being understood, can you sort of explain um, what you're planning uh, with Blockstack in terms of, I mean, we talked about features a little bit, applications, um, what you're planning on building on top of Bitcoin uh, in terms of what a user could expect? Yes, so I think, Going, going back to the history of the project a little bit, right? So it, it started from uh, Princeton University. I, I did my PhD there. And the early team was all computer scientists, right? Mostly from Princeton. And we raised venture capital to really do R&D work, like core R&D work that is needed at the, at the, at the fundamental layers like uh, blockchains and uh, storage systems and, and, and authentication protocols with mm-hmm. the idea that these systems need to scale to hundreds of millions of users. Uh, and, and by the way, and, and the, one of the intentions for uh, kind of like this milestone uh, of initial user growth was also to test out our infrastructure that can it scale to millions of users, which we very successfully did, right? Uh, like with a, with a very serious face, we can uh, go to Twitter and tell them that if you want to register 200 million Twitter usernames uh, on a blockchain, you could do that. Like we have a production system that can take that load, right? So, so that's, that's how the project started, like explicit R&D and then building out the developer uh, tools and developer platform opening it up to developers so that they can build real applications. Like I think you, if you look at ecosystems, uh, especially like Web3 applications, uh, we are probably the same order of like a EOS or uh, half of Ethereum or something, which I'm very proud of. It's a very small team still, like 30 people. Uh, uh, the, the market cap of the project isn't very uh, large because we have, we have taken a very regulated route. Uh, and, and, you know, there was no token or trading for the initial five years of the project, which is also very unique, right? So we, we focused on building real value, uh, solving real problems for developers. And now developers are able to build all these privacy focused applications on our network to the extent that if you look at our community, uh, there are our community members who communicate with me over Dmail, which is a decentralized email service fully built on Blockstack, you're not touching any uh, centralized infrastructure. They would share documents over Gaia, which is a fully functional, scalable, uh, uh, decentralized storage system that we have built out. They are actually signing legal documents using BlockuSign, which is uh, an application fully you know, uh, private and between two people where you're using your keys to actually sign uh, a document, like not, you know, just like you type something and there's a signature on the doc. So these are real apps that are being used with people, which is something extremely, extremely exciting for us, right? And, and that is what we are focused on. Blockstack PBC as a company is mostly focused on developer tools, right? We actually do not build any applications. Out of the 400 applications that are already there, most of them built in, uh, in last year, 2019, we have built an ex- exactly zero of them. Right. All of these applications have been built by uh, by, by developers and, uh, and other teams on top. Right. So, so our, our focus will continue to be on developer tools, on bringing like real uh, apps and making these, this dream of Web3 uh, uh, a reality. And uh, I think that's that's the, the, the mission of the project. Yeah, uh, Vinib, um, I, I have to ask, have, have you ever uh, watched Silicon Valley? Uh, yes, I have. And I was um, uh, an advisor to the show for season five and season six. So part of the uh, kind of like the storyline is uh, loosely based on you know, some of the conversations they've had with me. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I was about to say, I mean, the, I'm, sure, I'm sure that uh, that whole story can't be lost on you, uh, some, at least on some days when you're, when you're looking at this stuff, because uh, 
honestly, uh, when you guys, when, when you talk ab- about block stack, uh, it does sound a lot like uh, Pied Piper. There are a lot of connections. So that's actually very interesting to know that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I, think, I think we get that a lot. Like sometimes people understand what we are doing because of the fact that they've seen, seen the season and then they get uh, really excited uh, when they know that we were actually involved uh, yeah, with the show. Well, uh, do you have a Guilfoyle on your team? And, and how, how do you compare yourself to Richard Hendricks? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you have a, a Guilfoyle, but they, they did ask us about, um, you know, weird personalities. Like they, they really went deep into it. And they were like, what kind of weird personalities have you seen uh, in crypto? And, you know, I would describe people who only kind of like just eat meat and nothing else, right? <laughs> yeah. They were like fascinated by the ad. And then... Also, like the, 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 the people from the HBO show are really, really interesting. Like they would get me to uh, technically evaluate some diagrams on a whiteboard, which would just be passively in the background in a scene. But they wanted the diagrams to be technically correct. That's fine. That, that, that's the level of detail that they uh, kind of uh, go into. And uh, once they uh, asked us to write... Uh, uh, quote, quote unquote ICO white paper for Pied Piper, right? Yeah. And they were like, we can even publish it and you can even reference Blockstack in it. And our team had a lot of fun with it. I think we ended up not doing it because a lot was going on at work, but we had a fun kind of like a afternoon. We were throwing ideas for what would go into a white paper. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys ever considering uh, uh, using an AI <laughs> for, your, uh, for your platform? Uh, no, no, not, not, not at all. I don't, I don't really even see how that would, that would fit, but uh, you know, just cause the show I had to ask. Yep. No, I, I think I'm, I'm very skeptical of AI uh, applications and blockchains because it's, it's almost like by definition, the AI needs access to a lot of data. And what you're doing with these platforms is you're actually reducing access to a lot of data by any single party. Right. So it's, it's there's a little bit of a conflict there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I, I appreciate your transparency with me. Absolutely. It was, it was a pleasure being on the show and I've been, I've been a reader of the magazine for many years now. So it's, it's great, great to talk to you. The Bitcoin Magazine podcast is a BTC media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find us on Twitter at Bitcoin Magazine, and you can find out about other engaging shows we produce by subscribing to our feed on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.